so um, I'm grateful that uh, you accepted our invitation and I'm um, very happy to have you here in mm -hmm. our interview today. Mm -hmm. My name is Sun, uh, I'm a reporter from Supreme Master Television and uh, we do have a good governance program which features the individuals who are in government doing some great works in their country, and to the people, to the environment, and to the animals we have farm. So uh, we found out that, and also we have done some background research about you, that you're doing wonderful work as the youngest parliament member in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would like to hear more about Cabinet you. Member. <coughs> Cabinet member. Cabinet member. Yeah, there's a very young cosplayer in the parliament. She's the youngest member. It's only you. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. but it's mm -hmm. it's a yeah. Yes. I'm the youngest cabinet member. That's right. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Good to know. So uh, we would like to hear more about your response to the COVID mm -hmm. and plus uh, the, your initiative on social innovation now mm -hmm. and. Um, and overall about your IT background, how you are looking at the, the future of sure. um, this um, digital democracy tools and mm -hmm. overall those. I'm glad to share. Mm -hmm. Yes. The, so let us get this started with the first question because we watched all your interviews on the, um, the news agency BBC and TED and CNN. You will describe very nicely about your work and your role mm -hmm. uh, as a digital minister from this common mm -hmm. Taiwan is like this one of the safest country yeah. during this pandemic so it's an amazing thing and um, so could you briefly tell sure. us mm -hmm. your uh, main role mm -hmm. uh, for this COVID response in Taiwan? Sure so uh, my role is the digital minister in charge of social innovation and by social innovation we mean people uh, not uh, public servants um, like ordinary citizens who think of a better way uh, to further a social good uh, they can uh, propose this idea and i'm the one who amplify their idea for example there was a young person uh, named Howard Wu uh, in Tainan City, uh, who at the end of January um, invented a way for people to report uh, which stores still have masks and which store has run out of masks. So people do not have to, uh, you know, shop around for like five different stores before they can find some medical masks. Uh, it's a really good project, um, except I relies on ordinary cons consumers to report uh, whether there's still masks in storage. And so I saw the idea, I bring it to the premier, saying that we need to support this young person and provide uh, the real-time availability in all pharmacies in real time, that is to say every 30 seconds. So instead of relying on people to report, the pharmacists who are very professional and trusted by the community, they do not have to say, you know, um, like every day uh, we have run out of masks or not, they can just simply post online. Uh, and then everybody looking at the map, even people queuing in the line can actually check that nowadays if you take your national health insurance card, which covers more than 99.99% of citizens and also residents to a pharmacy, then you can get nine medical masks uh, per two weeks or 10 if you are a child. And the person queuing after you can just refresh the map and see the number actually decrease by nine or 10, just in a couple of minutes. And so this builds trust, like every time everybody look at the map, they can see that the system is working. If rather after I purchase, the people queuing after me see rather the number increases, they will call the toll-free number line 1922 right there because that would be something wrong. So instead of asking people to trust the government's numbers, the government trusts the citizens with open data and to make sure that everybody can earn the trust by this uh, repeated participatory accountability. Wow, that sounds fantastic. And so the, um, the open data and how this digital democracy tool um, combines the open data mm -hmm. and bringing up all the successful mm -hmm. um, uh, response. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, uh, the mask availability map is built upon uh, the previous maps, for example, around air quality. So in Taiwan, especially in the middle areas of Taiwan, there's many people who care a lot about PM 2.5 and other air quality indicators. Instead of waiting for the Environmental Protection Agency, they set up their own air boxes 
that is to say less than 100 US dollars each, they can put it into their balcony, into their schools and so on, and contribute the real time uh, measurement of air quality closest to where people are, instead of the official stations, which may be very precise, but are uh, quite far from where people are. And so after gathering tens of thousands of those people participating in the environmental measurement, they come to be even more trusted and more legitimate than the government. And then they started uh, negotiating with the government. And because in Taiwan, we're a place, according to the human rights uh, organization, Civicus Monitor, we're the one in Asia country that is completely open in the sense that people have the absolute freedom of speech, of assembly, of the press, and so on. We're the most open way in the whole of Asia. So the environmental minister cannot uh, beat the citizen scientists. We must join them. And so we learned about their ideas of air boxes and negotiated this with them so that we also put their design to the, for example, industrial parks where the citizen scientists cannot get access to. But turns out the government owns the lamp. So we can put those uh, small air boxes on the lamps and therefore complete the picture that the society started. So the social sector in Taiwan, not-for-profit organizations, social entrepreneurs, co-ops, and so on, always had a uh, better idea, a good uh, way of getting people agreeing on the social norm, and its government's role is called a reverse procurement uh, to implement the ideas started by the social sector. And together, we can tell the businesses um, that if they are you know, doing the emissions, pollutions, and so on, there's a lot of people watching. So so the companies will be incentivized then uh, to use a more circular way, a way that is less um, harmful to the environment. Okay, that's wonderful. And um, your, um, you were um, in the interview with Ted, you were mentioning about your job description mm. and your philosophy that how yeah. uh, the everything is, ev the everything has cracks and then mm -hmm. the where the light gets in. Mm. And something sounded really you know, mm. much more beyond that you're thinking of mm. the things um, in it broadly. Mm. So could you explain a little bit further about that? Sure. So um, my job description is, is like goes like this. Uh, when we see the Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, Let's make it collaborative learning. And when we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear the singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. So this is a simple idea that instead of technology as something like a progress we have to chase, the society need to chase technology. Instead, technology is just our assistant the technology should adapt to the society's needs and norms instead of the society adapting to the technology. It's as simple as that. Uh, that's, that's wonderful. And how did you come up with this job description? Mm -hmm. How is it defined in, in all of Taiwan uh, in practice? Mm. I was uh, in New Zealand when I wrote this, and I was uh, listening to the uh, Maori chant and dance uh, and feel the, the mana, <laughs> the, the spirit uh, of the land. Uh, and because in uh, the Maori um, culture, they say that uh, they traveled, the culture traveled all the way from Taiwan. So they have a connection with the Taiwan indigenous cultures as well. So I thought back of the time that I spent in the Ulai Mountain with the Atayali people um, and the indigenous spirit uh, that talks about sustainability, not in the term sustainability, which is a recent term, but by the act of acting sustainably with the nature. That is to say, when they make a decision as a community, as a culture, they do not change something just for this generation. They think about the environment, how it's going to be like seven generations down the line. And so because if you take a very long view, then technology are there to make the 
world a better place for the upcoming generations. But if you take a short view, then you may improve, uh, for example, vanity uh, for this generation, but at the cost of the future generations. So I think the long view is what I got from the Maori chance. And so practically speaking, we're requiring now uh, the largest company, publicly listed companies, they have to file the sustainability reports. That is to say, their work because uh, their shareholders are many. Uh, their shareholder value is, in a sense, the value of the public. And so they have to make it accountable to the public that while pursuing the bottom line of profit, they would not hurt the bottom lines of people and of planet. So profit, people, and planet are the triple bottom lines that they need to further. And we have a social innovation uh, platform that we also invite companies and co-ops and universities and credit unions and everything that are not yet publicly listed, nevertheless disclose every year how they are making progress toward the people and the planet bottom lines. Uh, as to, uh, because Taiwan is mostly small and medium enterprises, to imbue this kind of long view thinking for the small and medium enterprises, uh, as well as the social entrepreneurs, instead of just for the public listed companies. This is like a um, incubator program to make sure that everybody think responsibly, not just the public listed ones. So how do you encourage this, all this ethical and moral actions, um, like especially in the social platform that you initiated? So there's uh, two uh, main ways. One is called buying power. Uh, if one discloses one's uh, planet and people bottom lines, then uh, and we list it on the um, catalog. And if, for example, there was a, a coffee shop called a Luisa, uh, and instead of working with its previous uh, milk vendor, uh, it started to work with Pure Milk or Xian Ru Fang, uh, which is one such social enterprise that started with crowdfunding and is continuing to make accountability by the animal doctors and so on on the um, animal ethics uh, as well as the planetary commitments that they make. And so by integrating the supply chain uh, of the Louisa Cafe to prefer Pure Milk, not only Louisa Coffee um, managed to solve a PR disaster, <laughs> they actually built brand uh, recognition because people see that its milk vendors are making these contributions to the planet and to the society. And so this kind of collaboration, uh, I would just go out and give the buying power award uh, to this kind of partnership. So this is the first kind of reward. <laughs> and the second kind of reward is that we make sure that if people um, declare publicly their planetary and society commitments, we uh, find them unlikely partners. Uh, for example, the Carrefour, um, which is a large supermarket, uh, through our award of the Asia Pacific Social Innovation Partnership Award, we highlight their partnership uh, with the Animal Welfare Society uh, in Taiwan, the Dongwu Xiaohui and Zilhui. Uh, and so for the free range uh, eggs and so on, which used to be something uh, like a niche topic that not many people in Taiwan uh, care about free range chickens, but they managed uh, to immerse oneself into a, a caged chicken uh, situation and show um, animal um, cruelty or at least industrial uh, farming, uh, but in a gagafu uh, setting. Uh, and that uh, is a shock uh, to many uh, people who went to the exhibition and who went to the booth. And in that way, uh, they were able to then uh, spread uh, the idea of a more ethical way of uh, getting eggs from chickens and so on. And so I think this is a very good partnership. And after the receiver award, now Gagafu is uh, partnering with a lot more uh, social advocacy groups, not only on the regulation side, but also on the uh, people's consumer awareness side. Okay, that's amazing. So how do you see um, this innovation platform will go on in, uh, in practice and how it would benefit uh, Taiwan? Yeah, the platform uh, as of this year uh, went to the presidential level because the platform is now also the platform for the presidential hackathon. And the presidential hackathon is a um, idea that we get those uh, social innovations and every year the president chooses five to give them a trophy. 
The trophy is the shape of Taiwan with a micro projector underneath. If you turn it on, it shows the project、uh, leaders getting this trophy from the president and the president promising whatever you try in the past three months, we're committed to make it a national priority for the next twelve months. So it's the presidential power as a hackathon award. So one of the winner、uh, for this year's social innovation hackathon、uh, is the Circuit Plus,、uh, which in Mandarin is called. Feng Cha, Feng Cha or tea serving,、uh, is a, a very venerated tradition in Taiwan,、uh, where the shops、uh, would put a very large pot of tea outside of their door for people who are thirsty to refill their cups.、Um, it's like a self-serving water station.、Uh, it's been going on for I think a hundred years or so、uh, or more. And so、uh, the app. That the people、um, working on the presidential hackathon team developed、uh, is a phone chat app where it shows water refill stations near you, and not only、uh, is the quality of the water checked, it has a like Pokemon Go, a a progress bar <laughs> that shows how many other people are doing this water refill along with you,、uh, whether you can unlock some mission and visit some special like locally culturally significant shops and so on, and you can collect. Coins that can be redeemed、uh, into uh, the local,、um, you know, favorite black tea or green tea or whatever, like specialty drinks and so on. So this is、uh, a game based on、uh, not using plastic bottles, but rather、uh, using refill、um, as a habit, because、uh, we know that people who refill is a habit, and for people who buy fresh. Bottles. That's also a habit, and habits are very difficult to change. So, making a funny game where people would not think that oh, I'm、uh, getting you know、uh, water refills, but rather、uh, I'm participating in the revitalization of the tea serving culture,、uh, and that is an angle that can get people to really change the behavior and save plastic bottles and save the planet. And so, that was one of the winners of the presidential hackathon. Oh wow, that's that's something sounds really innovative. So based on this,、um, all this work that you are initiating and、uh, also working on,、um, could you also、uh, explain about the transparency of the government?、Mm-hmm. How this uh, um, mm-hmm. Uh, government Taiwan mm-hmm. is mm-hmm.、Uh, encouraging or inspiring all these、uh, beautiful works to、mm-hmm. take place and、mm-hmm. benefiting the society as a whole. Sure. So,、um, as a digital minister, all the meeting that I chair and all the interviews that I give uh, is uh, published on the internet for everyone to see, either as a transcript or,、uh, in this case, a video. So while you're recording this,、uh, we're also recording it, and we'll be publishing it uh, unedited uh, on our YouTube channel. And the reason why is that in Mandarin, digital minister or 数位政委 Uh, also means a plurality of ministers, shu wei, as in many, right?、Uh, and so、uh, I, my idea is that everybody can see through my eyes, like a virtual reality, how a ministerial position work like. And instead of just sharing the policies we make, we share how we're making the policies, the things that we have considered. And because of this,、um, people were able then, for example, when we're、um, working on the e-sport、uh, regulations. It used to be that the Ministry of Culture doesn't think e-sport is a culture because it doesn't have hundreds of years of tradition,、uh, and the、uh, um, agency of sport、uh, in the Ministry of Education didn't consider it sport because you move m- maybe only your hands but not your body,、uh, and the Ministry of Economy doesn't think this is a、uh, economical、uh, trade because this is more like performing arts. Uh, so maybe it should be the Ministry of Culture. So all the three ministries have very different takes on e-sport, and e-sport kind of fall into this,、um, you know, Bermuda Triangle, <laughs> where there is no、uh, competent authority、uh, that can work on the rights of the e-sport、uh, athletes. And so I just shared the three ministries' positions. Publicly as a transcript、uh, four years ago when I first became digital minister, and there's many、uh, people who are very wise on the internet who look at those transcripts and、uh, tells us, for example, that、um, Go or Weiqi, which is a board game like chess,、um, is now according to them a esport because most of the Go games,、uh, like Bridge, are now played online. 
Uh, and because the Ministry of Culture have existing regulations uh, about, for example, alternate military service and so on for the uh, Go players, uh, if we reclassify Go as an eSport, then all the other esports uh, can just uh, match what the Go players make and so on. And so by sharing uh, our um, uncertainty, by sharing our doubt, by having no problem about uh, face or means, uh, like uh, we can honestly say, we don't know, please help us figure it out. Uh, that's the crack in everything. And that's how the light gets in. That's how the social sector contributed their wonderful creative ideas. And finally, we have eSport recognized as an intellectual sport. Oh, that's beautiful. Um, I was just wondering, um, you are such a, uh, you have this such a broad vision towards all these beautiful things could take place. Um, on the other hand, all this um, some conventional way of doing things, so the government or uh, the citizens that who are not really willing to contribute the uh, idea, and how do you approach all this idea to the public in making it happen? was humor. Uh, yeah, we have a saying called humor over rumor. Uh, because whenever there's a rumor about something, a conspiracy theory about something, uh, it means that people care, right? People put their attention on something. There was one time during the um, pandemic days where there's a rumor that says we're going to run out of instant noodles soon. Uh, the instant noodles are, uh, you know, going to be hard to find. So people just rushed out and purchase instant noodles. Uh, and that means that people are worried uh, about the food safety. Uh, but instead of uh, you know, sharing very blunt numbers, uh, the premier just shared a very simple picture that says, there's a lot of instant noodles, buy as much as you want, uh, and then add to it, but to uh, take care of your health, buy some fresh vegetables too. Uh, and then the uh, mayors of all the agricultural counties and cities in Taiwan uh, just started sharing those very funny memes about their favorite agricultural products and how to balance, uh, have a good diet and so on. So it became a, uh, like a festival uh, online around celebrating the agricultural capability of Taiwan. And so uh, once people laugh about something, they will not feel outrage about the thing. And so they could be calm and actually look at the food safety picture and found that Taiwan is actually very safe in terms of food safety uh, and also learn something about a balanced diet. Uh, and so we try to make this educational, but also always share in a humorous way so that the humor uh, would make other people more likely to share it. And by humor, we don't mean that we make fun of other people. We make fun of ourselves. <laughs> and that is the idea of humor. Over rumor. I see, I see. I heard you're this, uh, you were explaining about this in one of the interviews. So it's a good thing to have. Um, so you are also, um, uh, you were mentioning about um, how to, uh, there was an interview with the Thomson Reuters that where you mentioned how. Um, to blend all these values mm -hmm. of environment and social and economic to mm -hmm. benefit the society yes. as a whole without mm -hmm. needing to um, make trade-offs. Yeah, yeah, the, the mm -hmm. lobbying efforts. That's right. Mm -hmm. So um, is there any possibility to mm -hmm. uh, that, that such idea could, um, could take place mm -hmm. in, in real mm -hmm. life? Yeah, in my experience, if I tell the lobbyist that we're going to publish the transcript or the video afterward, the lobbyists start arguing only using public benefit arguments. But if uh, this is behind closed door, if this is not transparent, then of course they may propose something that may be good for them and may be good for me or maybe good for the government, but bad for some other people, <laughs> right? Uh, and so in order to make a Pareto improvement, that is the improvement based on the idea that nobody has to suffer because of a change in the society, uh, like a win-win-win-win, or at least not lose <laughs> a situation uh, that could be discovered, it's vastly important that we make sure that our values are aligned. And how do we uh, 
to give an account of whether our values are aligned, well, it's through radical transparency, not just transparent in the results, but also transparent in the process. If every lobbyist are willing to make publicly visible arguments, then it's like completing a puzzle together. We can all add to the picture without taking away each other's pictures. And that is what we mean by a multi-stakeholder form. Yeah. I see. The internet itself is organized this way. Um, that's that's great. So, um, like we are mostly covering the all the the um, the content that we were looking for, mm -hmm. and um, we would like to hear more about um, the the open source mm -hmm. platform mm -hmm. and how this is also well. This is. Anyway, everybody is getting to know this is quite instrumental mm. to coming up with something more advanced. Yeah, definitely. And uh, what about your mm. opinions on this? How do you see this future of AI and mm. uh, all this technological advancement could, advancement could benefit the environment mm. and the society and mm. the animals, that including all the mm. necessary aspects? Yeah, uh, to me, AI is assistive intelligence, meaning that uh, just like a human assistant, we would ask for their value to align with ours. And if they make some decisions or actions that seems questionable, we will require them to give a full account. So value alignment and uh, accountability are the most important things around AI. And open source, open data are just a way to make sure that this accountability is easier to achieve. Because if your assistant speaks a different language from you, or if they don't share their thoughts, they may be very dutiful, very responsible, but it's not accountable. And you do not know uh, whether uh, they make such a decision uh, in a way because if they agree with your agreement, uh, your values, or whether it's just their own values and it may change drastically uh, when the next conflict or tension comes. And so again, uh, not just understanding the what of the AI, but the why of AI. Why would AI make such a decision? Uh, this is very important. And so open source, open data, open API, and so on are just ways that saying, um, like if you buy a car, you're free to take the front lid up and is inspect each component in that engine. If they seal off uh, the front lid, that means that you cannot understand why the car works. And if people do not have access to such a knowledge, they would not be able to then to reason about the mechanics or to improve upon the car. But scientific progress is based on the open access and publishing model. So if people can only be consumers and never be producers of data, of media and so on, then we would um, just have an elite class that make all the decisions and other people that just follows the decisions. And that stops to be a democracy, uh, right? And so to really uh, get the democratic attitude and society uh, in, on the digital age, we need to build the same accountability that we as ministers, we need to be held accountable. When journalists ask me a question, I need to answer honestly, <laughs> truthfully, and so on. Uh, and so, and I'm a human minister, but if there are going to be AI systems in the ministerial position in the future, then the same access by the journalists to the AI need to be ensured, and openness is one such a way. I see. So then how do you see all this, um, your way of thinking of this assistant intelligent mm -hmm. tools could help the government while well, it's mm -hmm. been helping? Maybe how do you see, mm -hmm. maybe not only Taiwan, to the other countries, mm -hmm. this your approach could be applicable? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So uh, it's useful on three different areas. Uh, one is uh, simply about saving time. Um, there's a lot of public sector work that are routine, that are paper-based. And for a paper-based copy to make 10 copies, it's 10 times more time and resource compared to make one copies. But in the digital, make 10 copies, make 10,000 copies. It's the same time, the same resource. Uh, and so on the digital world, making copies is essentially at no marginal cost. So if we can digitize more of the government records and so on, when the person says, oh, I want to access um, all the government knows about me in one place, we make such a copy and it comes at no cost. 
But if this person uh, goes to the various different offices to ask for paper copies, it's very time consuming for this person. And so the My Data Portal in Taiwan shows this idea of just with one uh, button, you can download everything a certain agency has on you, and then you can exercise your rights of updating it or asking for deletion or asking uh, to uh, make a new entries and things like that. And so this uh, one click access of all the personal data, I think this is very time saving, not only for citizens, but also for public servants, because we do not want to spend our days making photocopies. Right? <laughs> if this could be automated, the, the more the better. So that's the one. And aside from digitization, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> let's do this again. So aside from the digitization, uh, we also make optimization. For example, um, a lot of people in the Taiwan Water Company are listening to the water pipes for possible leaks, uh, because in Taiwan, water resource uh, is an important thing. Uh, but on the Jilong region, for example, it takes on average two months before a water leak uh, to happen and it to be discovered by the rotating people who listen to the pipe with a stethoscope-like device. And so using assistive intelligence, they built a chatbot as part of presidential hackathon a couple of years ago so that the repair people can wake up and look at a chatbot. And a chatbot will inform them that these are the three likely leaking places by analyzing the water pressure, water flow, and things like that, and with like 70% uh, confidence. So if they travel to only those three places with 70% confidence, chances are that they will spend most of their day, instead of routinely checking the pipes that are not leaking, they will be spending time creatively thinking about how to plug those leaks, right? And so this is more job satisfaction and it saves water. <laughs> and it also uh, shares, for example, with the New Zealand Wellington Water Company. That team eventually went to Wellington and because uh, the climate change, they did not have a water shortage problem, but uh, increasing, they're now facing this problem. So instead of uh, you know, just buying a certain solution, they co-created this diagnostics tool that can optimize people's time uh, with the Taiwan government. And so the um, cross-sectoral um, and international collaboration could be based on this optimization of our environmental resources. So that's optimization. And finally, it could also lead to new ways to think about uh, public sector service. For example, to fire a tax in Taiwan used to be you have to go to the tax office or you have to download this kind of ugly, hard to use uh, Windows software and you have to get a Windows software. And nowadays you can go to the convenience store to insert your NHI card. And if your income tax is less than 20K Taiwan dollars that year, you can just print that QR code uh, and hand it to the staff uh, at a convenience store and pay for it and that's it. And, and so it's um, easy to pay your income taxes now in more than 12,000 different convenience store pots. And they essentially become extensions of the tax agency. And that's a kind of innovation that could only happen if we have all the card re readers figured out, we have the connection to the National Health Insurance uh, Agency figure out and so on. So it builds upon the digitization and optimization work. So it does not only save time to improve the quality, but it also um, makes people trust each other more because the convenience store people can show the elderly or people who are not that used uh, to digital technologies how to uh, operate a kiosk. And the elderly people, once they learn about it, they can teach other elderly people. And so people's trust in each other, just like the mask availability map, increases every time someone teaches someone else how to use such innovations. All right. Yeah, that's, that sounds very helpful. Um, so um, could you also tell us more, um, because we we know that you gender identity. Sure. Um, it's whatever. Um, <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. We are trying to link uh, the, the feeling inside and how it could be also connected with the, the environmental yeah. destruction. That's and right. All this speciesism stuff, mm -hmm. and the animal farming. Mm. So we are trying to link with like, there's some crack in it, maybe somehow. That's right. And how, how do you explain mm -hmm. all this interlinked um, concept of mm -hmm. this um, understanding? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, the idea of uh, intersectionality, uh, which is the idea that each of us have some parts of us that are in the kind of superior privileged position, mm -hmm. but some of 
part of us are in the minority or less privileged position. Um, for example, when I was really young um, and I first learned writing, I'm left-handed, so I write with my left hand. And my dad and my grandma, uh, my dad's mother, are all left-handed. But when they were children, uh, the society taught them to uh, have to learn to write with their right hand. Uh, because uh, according to my grandma, uh, all the telephone booths uh, are on the right hand <laughs> of the telephone booth. Like the society was designed to be more friendly to people who prefer their right hand and less friendly for people with their left hand. And so they had to change. Uh, and so uh, they also taught me uh, to learn to write with my right hand. But I tried for a year and then I discovered keyboard. So I can type with both my hands. Uh, and after that, of course, telephones eventually gets redesigned. Nowadays, the telephone is just a glass tablet, right? Uh, it doesn't you know, care whether they're uh, in your left hand or your right hand. Uh, and so handedness becomes less of a thing uh, that uh, divides people apart. And people don't pay much attention to left or right handers anymore, uh, thanks to the universal design. Or like when I was um, as a child uh, in the city of Taipei, uh, we do not see many people with wheelchairs. But when I go to Germany, uh, when I was um, 11 years old uh, in 1992, uh, there's quite a few people with wheelchairs uh, in the streets. And I am like, uh, so is the Taiwanese people more healthy? <laughs> so, so that we don't use wheelchairs. Of course it's not. It's because the Taipei city at the time was not friendly to people in wheelchairs. It's very difficult for them to navigate. Uh, and so they just stay home. Uh, and so <laughs> just making sure that people see the people of uh, different varying abilities are fully participating citizens is very eye-opening. And nowadays we have uh, like uh, quite a few parents uh, in Taiwan are uh, making sure that the playgrounds for children are designed with the children, for the children, by the children, uh, and children of very different capabilities, uh, including wheelchairs and so on, need to enjoy the playground equally uh, in a way that is fully inclusive. So this idea of inclusion, I think, uh, is the main thing that brings us apart um, into the same um, idea of my vulnerability enables me to empathize with your uh, vulnerability. Uh, and even though I may be in a privileged position in some attributes, I will not abuse this position. So we may be physically apart, but we are connected in our feeling of vulnerability uh, through intersectionality. And I think that is very important. I see. So how do you describe about, um, I mean, the, your, your opinions on this? Uh, on the linking with the environmental mm -hmm. um, issues that mm -hmm. we are having, mm -hmm. facing mm -hmm. as a commoner, mm -hmm. how do you say, as a commonality? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, so we're privileged, of course, as homo sapiens, as human beings uh, on this planet because uh, we invent technologies <laughs> that can change uh, other uh, beings' status uh, and feelings uh, for the better or for the much worse, right? So, so it's all up to the technology wielders and human beings are at the moment the, the primary technology wielder species uh, in the planet. But uh, we are not, um, we're not that different in our capacity to suffer. Our capacity to suffer as compared with most other vertebrates is roughly the same, right? So even though we can use more technology, um, we suffer as much as other vertebrate animals and they suffer as much as we do. And so it enables us, if we have the idea of intersectionality in mind, enables us, uh, for example, when we feel pain, uh, we can remind ourselves that other vertebrate animals also feel pain the same way as we do. Uh, now for octopus, they also feel pain, but maybe not in the same way as we do, <laughs> but we can still try to sympathize with octopus. <laughs> and, and everyone, of course, have different uh, ability to extend the intersectionality and empathy forward, which is fine. Some people are vegan, some people are oyster vegan, uh, some people are vegetarians, <laughs> and so on. Uh, I'm an oyster uh, vegan when I have the choice, but when other people order food from the menu and it's already cooked, uh, I'm not that picky. Uh, and so that's where uh, I put my empathy. And so I think what people uh, can remind each other is that uh, we're a much um, 
a large part of the decision that we make would determine whether other species in the planet still have a future and whether they, in their future, may evolve into more intelligent uh, species and open up new possibility for us, right? If the early hominid um, did not get a chance because of dinosaurs or something, <laughs> wielding technology, then we would not have the human civilization. And, and if we destroy the habitat for other species, if we make them suffer, um, you know, out of negligence or uh, even for fun, then uh, they would not have a future uh, to evolve into their own civilizations. So for us, I think we're just a steward uh, for the planet Earth uh, on this particular space and time. And we're here for maybe a while, but we need to ensure that we do not uh, destroy the possibility of other intelligent civilizations that comes after us, after maybe we move to other planets or something. Amazing, wonderful answer, thank you so much. Um, so, um, we were kind of um, uh, would like to also hear. Um, well, you just mentioned now that um, we heard that you were almost a vegan, and we want to also link this your idea of being more morally and ethically uh, mm -hmm. responsible towards the uh, other things. Um, so, do you have like any? interesting things or what you're working on, um, including maybe something with your niece. Mm -hmm. uh, could you tell us more about um, mm -hmm. your your work and the, your vision towards the future and plus uh, how this good works could be also applied for other countries or other communities? Yeah, I think there's a lot of uh, room for designers, for artists, for people who are creative to find new and interesting ways to attract people to the idea of that you need to take care of the planet and the people uh, in order to make a profit. So the people and planet before the profit, but it only becomes profitable if people find it interesting and attracting. Um, and so, of course, the Circle Plus tea serving app is a very good example. And I also uh, helped the crowdfunding campaign of Clay, uh, which is a um, non-animal letter, but they make a bag that looks very much like a letter, uh, but it does not pollute the environment, nor do it harm the animal. Uh, but uh, of course, for people to um, purchase a leather bag, they're in, into um, you know, some um, you know, textile feelings, some touches of uh, what, whatever nobility it conveys or whatever, right? So, so you need to uh, not only recreate uh, such um, designer feelings in this new uh, vegan leather, but also to add even more to it so that people, just like people who prefer the um, Beyond Meat to uh, meat or the Impossible Burger, to burger, uh, one need to, to feel like beyond. So not only that it need to taste good, it also need to taste in a way that seems futuristic, uh, that you uh, find this as something generally novel, something new, uh, something that you would share with your friends in order for it to uh, make into a, a widespread idea, not just uh, uh, people who are already vegan, but people who are not vegan would prefer for example, the Impossible Burger, uh, not because it's vegan, but because it tastes great, right? Uh, and so uh, we need more creative types. Uh, we need more people who are into, you know, gastronomy, into design, into art, and so on, uh, to show that this kind of lifestyle is preferable not only because it's ethical, but because it's fun. Yeah. Um, oh, I, I just remember like what um, we would like to hear about mm -hmm you have a team and your team would be really working hard to uh, in implement all these ideas mm -hmm. that you got. And mm -hmm. So how do you, you know, um, make those people more efficient mm -hmm. and effectively working mm -hmm. on the tasks that they, they have? Mm -hmm. Like, do you encourage any meditation mm -hmm. practice? Mm -hmm. Like, for example, in Japan and mm -hmm. Silicon Valley, they do have, they found that this mm -hmm. is, very 
helpful for mm -hmm. people's performance. Mm, yeah, yeah. I I make sure that there's plenty of uh, quietness uh, in the social innovation lab or in the closet bed room <laughs> that I just went into <laughs> right before this interview, right? So, so everybody can have some, um, as you said, meditation or pause um, throughout the day. And I also uh, emphasize that sleep is very important. So I would not, uh, for the people who work with me, uh, who do not, um, you know, want to be interrupted uh, on their off work time, uh, I do not um, you know, bother them about work. Uh, and so if there is a work issue that needs to be resolved, but it's already 10 p.m. or something, uh, instead of waking my colleagues up, uh, I will just handle that myself. <laughs> right? So um, I think it's very important for people to have a full night's sleep in order to carefully integrate whatever we have learned in the daytime so that by the time we wake up, we'll be a more holistic person. Uh, if we get interrupted all the time during the sleep, right before the sleep and by alarm clock and so on, uh, one would feel fragmented and therefore not that able to empathize or to take all the signs. Do you meditate? Do you practice any um, meditations? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I practice Taoist meditation. Oh, okay. So mm -hmm. how do you find it? Is it really helpful for you? Um, do you encourage to your team members? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I learned it when I was like four or five years old. <laughs> so it's been with me uh, as long as I remember. But most of my um, you know, colleagues have their own ways uh, to meditate, uh, some with music uh, and uh, some with coffee, apparently. <laughs> some was making tea and things like that. And I think, or flowers and so on. So I think everyone has their own way uh, to connect uh, to the cosmos. And so I'm not prescribing any particular method, but I make sure that there's plenty of time and space uh, for such any of us. I see. Um, could you also tell our speakers more about um, your social innovation lab? is planning to do in the, in the, in the near future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, very soon uh, we will have the social innovation, uh, the Asia Pacific Social Innovation Summit or APSIS. And this is the first time that it went digital. So it allows us to connect to the Social Enterprise World Forum, which was going to take place in Nova Scotia, Canada, but now it's online. So we make sure that this um, is become a worldwide event. And in that we will celebrate, for example, there's a chocolate company cho called Chocoloni uh, in uh, the Netherlands, uh, and which makes chocolate in a way that is fair trade, that doesn't harm the environment or the society, they're not exploitative and so on. And so by making sure that people learn about the production lines of the chocolates, it also uh, raises people's awareness of the imbalances in labor relationships and so on when it comes to the manufacturing of other chocolates. Uh, and so what, what we want is to uh, amplify through such digital means the best ideas and the best social innovations across the world. And we can then share uh, the not really best practice, maybe better practices and inspire a future where uh, people, regardless of their generation or their ethnicity or their, um, you know, areas of study, they can all feel connected through the global goals uh, into solving the problem uh, together as a group uh, partnering for the common goals uh, instead of just working with their own ideas and then canceling each other out. Uh, and so I think the um, Asia Pacific Social Innovation Summit is something that's really uh, worth a try and it's digital, so there's no excuse to miss it now. Uh, it's at APSIS.tw. Yes, I saw that. I yeah. started following you on Twitter actually, oh, yeah. and then saw that one. Mm -hmm. That's that's cool. We'll join for sure. Um, so, um, I'm a little bit ran out of question mm -hmm. there. So, do you have any like interesting mm -hmm. um, like the things that you were uh, um, which could benefit? the other people, any idea or initiative that you were mm -hmm. thinking of implementing, or also like this uh, social, um, you know, the Asia Pacific Summit, 
mm-hmm. may cover some mm-hmm. topics related to do this COVID response. Mm-hmm. Uh, how this the countries which are very much affected mm. could come out from this situation, mm-hmm. or also, it seems like it's gonna continue quite long mm. than we expected, yeah. and yes. plus also there might be another pandemic because mm-hmm. like SARS three point zero. Yeah, things are look <laughs> yeah. really uncertain. Mm-hmm. So, what do you think about all this, and mm-hmm. how do you? Um, what's your opinion on? How other countries should react all this um, mm-hmm. pandemics and mm-hmm. everything? Yeah, I think my main message is really the government should trust the citizens. In Taiwan, uh, we trust the citizens to, for example, wear a mask to protect oneself from one's own hands, uh, and it's such a simple idea that connects the calmness of mind. Uh, and the use of soap and alcohol, uh, hand sanitizers, and a mask. And because it only works if you have all three <laughs> together. It's like a piece of the puzzle. If you only wear a mask but doesn't wash your hands, that's not useful. If you uh, wash your hands but in a very panicked way, that doesn't work either. <laughs> because you have to wash it very thoroughly. Uh, and so there's a lot of ways, for example, with a cute smoke stock or a zong chai. Uh, it shares this um, a very uh, simple way to remember the various ways to wash your hands. Uh, and then we connect the idea of wearing mask into, you know, if you see other people wearing mask or if you wear a mask yourself and then you're going to touch your face, remember to do the <laughs> and, and so on. So, so I think that's really the, the Taiwanese playbook instead of uh, a very top-down way of explaining uh, very little and demanding very much. In Taiwan, the Central Epidemic Command Center doesn't demand much, but ex- explains everything. Like in the uh, used to be uh, every day, uh, right, in the 2 p.m. press conference, uh, they answer each and every question from the journalist, uh, no matter how um, absurd the ideas may seem. Uh, Commander Chen Shizhong always says, oh, let's think about it together. Oh, you can teach me. Let's uh, think about this together. So this is about a like Pygmalion effect, whereby trusting the citizens uh, with like full uh, of our heart, then the citizens become trustworthy and innovative. But if we doubt the citizens and put some, I don't know, um, you know, harsh fines or even uh, threatening a penalty of putting people in jail or things like that, um, issuing a state of emergency, a full citywide lockdown and things like that. It shows that maybe uh, the government is afraid of the people instead of trusting the people. And then the people will become something that the government is afraid of <laughs> because people will rebel <laughs> against uh, such draconian measures. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If we think the government, I think the citizens are trustworthy, the citizens will become worthy of our trust. If we think the citizens are to be feared, then the citizens will become very fearsome indeed. Uh, that's the main message I want to share. I see, I see. Wow, that's wonderful. Um, um, I don't know if the time is. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, yeah we're good. We're good. Mm-hmm. So um, thank you so much thank you. for. Um, joining us for this interview, and we are so mm-hmm. impressed and appreciative for the the answers, the wonderful answers that you have given. Yeah. So, um, yeah, mm-hmm. so thank you very much again. Yeah, thank you for the great questions. Do you have any other comments? Uh, messages? Or, mm-hmm. yes? Yeah, well, I would then just wish the uh, people watching the television um, a good local time and live long and prosper. <laughs> one more thing. Yeah, just, one more thing. Uh, uh, there is a thing that uh-huh. go over here. Yeah. So our I need TV, to sign our TV uh-huh. usually we do encourage people to be more veg and go yeah, green first. and save uh-huh. the planet. So could you tell us? Uh-huh. We do. We have lots of actresses and lots uh-huh. of famous people who said like be vegan, make these or. Yeah, I just had a lunch, but it was not entirely vegan. It has half an egg in it. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> or, or maybe yeah. you could say like. Be veg, go green to save the planet. Okay, sure, sure, uh, of course. And before that, you mm-hmm. can you can say like, uh, Emma Britton is the mm-hmm. uh, digital minister of sure. Taiwan. Um, uh huh. Okay. And sure. be veg, go green. Okay. Do I look at this one? Okay. This one. Okay. Okay. Hello, I'm Audrey Tang, Taiwan's digital minister. 
uh, and then and then just go straight into into this no connecting um, faces or what oh thank you oh you can say thank yeah. you for doing the work that you were um, to the in for the environment okay and more so be veg go ah, okay yeah. be veg go green to save the planet okay hello I'm Audrey Tang Taiwan's digital minister thank you all for all your work you're doing for our environment be veg go green to save the planet. That okay. was amazing. Thank awesome, you awesome. so much. Thank you. <laughs>